Helen King, a former Assistant Commissioner at the Metropolitan Police Service. Thank you so much for uh, coming to the studio uh, this morning. It's appreciated. Good morning. Um, I just want to talk uh, about a story that broke yesterday. Uh, the head of the police watchdog uh, resigning because uh, the police are investigating a historical allegation about him. I mean, you really couldn't make it up. Well, obviously, I don't know any more than is in the press already. Um, clearly, what needs to happen is that investigation needs to go ahead. No doubt the individual concerned is under, under huge pressure um, and his family and so on as well. Uh, and that process has to run. But at the same time, everyone, the public, complainants, police officers need to be able to have confidence in the IOPC as well and the, 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 the investigations that they carry out. I mean, you're completely right, of course, that we don't know the details of the allegation. It would be absolutely wrong uh, to make any uh, judgments there. Um, but I guess the police investigation, it seems, has been going on for some time, and yet Michael Lockwood only stepped aside when the Home Secretary told him to either quit or be suspended. It feels like there's question marks that the IOPC was even aware of the allegation. I, as I say, I know no more than is in the press. It's important that the police complaint system mm -hmm. is one that both officers and the public can have confidence in. And I think one of the, the constructive debates that is happening at the moment is looking at the way allegations against the police, including internal police misconduct right. investigations, are dealt with to make sure that police chiefs can sack police officers where that's appropriate mm -hmm. and that those investigations can be concluded more quickly and in ways that have public and officer confidence. Yeah, they're talking about the public uh, confidence in the police, but also other institutions as well, because it does feel like there's been... I guess I would almost class it as like a misogyny crisis in some of these institutions. Um, the London Fire Brigade are described as institutionally misogynistic and racist. Reports of people having their helmets filled with urine, Muslim officers having pork sausages put in their pockets. And of course, the Met Police too, uh, the, some of the WhatsApp messages uh, exchanged between officers joking about rape and domestic violence. Do you think there is institutional misogyny and racism in, in some of these organisations? Um, Let's be frank, the, the behaviours you, you've described are absolutely despicable um, and something that both we, the public, mm -hmm. but also the good, the many thousands of, of really good committed officers, firefighters and so on, will also find disgusting and want dealt with. But let's be frank, this isn't new. I think, in a sense, it's good that these conversations are being had. It's following on from the Me Too movement. Um, let's look at Parliament. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been a, a political correspondent. I suspect that, you know, there's been um, maybe old boys clubs and, and networks in a wide range of institutions. Yeah, I think certainly Parliament is not somewhere to throw stones. I think you're probably definitely right Exactly. There. Pu pu public and private sector. But absolutely right that it's now being exposed. And, of course, those who are put in positions of trust, which police officers, firefighters, emergency workers are, they do an incredible job, but we need to be able to have confidence in them. Mm. So it's right that these behaviours are exposed and dealt with. But at the same time, we need to think about how do we attract and keep really good staff, mm. those who have the moral courage, the ethical resilience, to do these really difficult jobs where they're dealing with tragedy, they're dealing with horrible situations, they're dealing often with hostility from the public, they feel they're under attack by the media, by politicians. And now we look at the, the state of our public services um, and the amount of work they're having to do, not always with the resources that they need. Um, so I think there's a question for all of us, yes, for leaders of these institutions, but also for us to say, how do we make sure that we have the public services that we deserve and we support those who are doing these incredibly difficult jobs on our behalf. I'm interested to know your thoughts on what, what can change, what can actually practically you know, be done. Um, the report in November, for example, found some recent examples of people who were cleared to join the police when they had past convictions for indecent exposure, assaults on women, even an arrest for rape. Do you think the vetting is up to scratch? Um, vetting can always be improved, but I do think it's a blunt tool. Mm. You can generally only uh, rely upon convictions um, and, of course, people with the wrong attitudes who are joining for the wrong reasons um, may be hiding that. So you've got to have the right training, you've got to have the right type of supervision and leadership and a culture where people will be reported mm. by their peers and then a system that can push them out of the organisation. Mm. At the moment, police regulations are unwieldy, 
police chiefs aren't the ones who are making the decisions about who should be sacked or not. Um, and I think it's right that that is being opened up for question yeah, now. Yeah, that was interesting because the new Met Police Chief, Sir Mark Rowley, um, in a recent interview said that, you know, he had to employ 100 people who were only allowed to work in backroom roles. And he said, it's completely mad that I had to employ people like that as police officers who you can't trust to have contact with the public. Mm -hmm. so, so is there a problem about effectively not being able to sack people? Yes. Um, some years ago, and I understand why from a public perception point of view, um, the makeup of police misconduct panels was changed so that there's a legally qualified chair rather than a senior police officer who chairs those panels. I chaired dozens of those panels during my, my service. And my experience of sitting with lay members is that they tend to be more sympathetic towards police officers, mm. um, maybe more understanding mm. uh, in, a, in a way that I felt actually they shouldn't be. Mm. Mm. Um, police officers have to maintain the highest standards of behaviour because they're enforcing the law on fellow, with fellow yeah. citizens. Um, so I do think that's one of a number of things that should be looked at in terms of the way police misconduct is dealt with. You know, you obviously in the, worked for the Met Police. Did you witness any of this kind of behaviour or was it things that are, I guess, more generally kept within groups of men? Or did you see anything? Or? Right, by the, by the time I joined the Met, I was very senior. I was a police officer for 30 years in, in three different police forces. Um, I'm not sure it's very helpful to start talking about incidents that sure. happened 35 years yeah. ago. But I think all women who've worked in male-dominated organisations, um, um, people from LGBT communities, um, people from different ethnic backgrounds, when you're in a minority within an organisation, that can feel like quite a lonely place. I think the recent report about the fire service is, is worth a read. Mm -hmm. And it includes in that a, an example of what a good team looks like, mm -hmm. where everyone feels that they're pulling together and the different strengths are seen to be making the team more stronger mm -hmm. um, themselves. But I think sometimes when you're the only one and the team ethos is about um, uh, a very traditional view um, That's a nice which, way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, which, which emphasises maybe the physicality of, of policing or firefighting and not recognising that actually the breadth of skills that you need to work effectively as a team means that you need pe different people within that team. Yeah, I thought one of the really interesting parts of that report into the London Fire Brigade was the figures on just how white and male an mm. organisation it is. Mm -hmm. um, you've said before that um, policing is an attractive career for sexual predators, bullies and bigots. Now, I know that you've mm -hmm. also emphasised the really good people who work in the police, and it's important to say that. But w what did you mean by that? Well, as I, as I said before, as a police officer, you have power over your fellow citizens. And also the way um, policing tends to be portrayed in the media. It's about pub fights, it's about driving cars fast. Mm -hmm. It's the more macho side, if you like, of, of the role. Whereas actually the figures show now um, about 80% of police incidents don't even involve a crime. Uh, the police more and more are picking up issues that come from people in mental health crisis, people with all sorts of, of vulnerabilities, missing children, mm -hmm missing elderly people and so on. So um, the way policing is seen, if you start off from, from a position where maybe you are a bully or a bigot, it looks like an attractive mm. career to you. Mm. And so that's why recruitment, training, um, and an internal culture that does report those who really don't deserve to carry the warrant card or to wear the uniform. And there is increasing evidence of that. Mm. Um, and reporting hotlines and so on that, that people can use. Yeah. I went on um, one of those websites the other day where people give anonymous reviews of their employers. And when you look at the one for the Metropolitan Police, there are a number of people who, who say they're, they're former officers complaining that you can't trust your colleagues any, anymore because they might report on you. Yeah. And I actually thought that that was a very positive sign, that people are realising you can't get away with behaviour where maybe you thought you were safe in the past. Just to pick up very quickly before we end on something you just said, 80% of police incidents don't involve a crime. Yes. I I'm quite staggered by that. Do you think that's because you're effectively having to take on a greater role in pub where public services, other public services, like the health service or whatever, are stretched? It's always been true, but I suspect even more so now. Um, policing sometimes gets called the social services of last resort. Mm. Of all the organisations that are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 
the police, in effect, are the last ones left standing. And I think we would all want somebody to go and help the most vulnerable in their hour of need. But the point that Mark Rowley is, is making at the moment mm. is that that does become a, a distraction and depletes resources from those incidents that really only the police can deal with. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a challenge for society, for those um, deciding where, where taxpayers' money goes within the public sector. Mm. Fascinating. Didn't realise that at all.